the preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Somewhere along the way, ladies and gentlemen, the lights will go back on again. Um, they have been on once already this evening, uh, but they went off again about three minutes after they were put on. So we may be going on and off all evening, which I hope. All right. Would you, is, if it's a little too dark for you, I, I can stop talking. I mean, I don't want to disturb the snooze. If you want to wait for a minute or two, we can wait. No, would you, no, would you no. prefer to begin or we begin? We can hang in the dark. Listen, it's difficult enough uh, having the chutzpah to stand here trying to keep you awake, most of you, after a hard day's work, and uh, you've probably just had something to eat. The normal reaction at this point is to go to sleep. At least if I have the lights on, I have them alive. But under these circumstances, the challenge is really tremendous this evening. At, at any case, I'm happy to take it because of the fact that we have come to a very interesting point. It seems I'm always saying that every time we begin. Everything is always interesting, but I must admit it is interesting, at least to me. Uh, and for a change, I'm going to take you out of Central and Eastern Europe. Every two minutes during the previous lectures, I've been saying in Central and Eastern Europe, in Eastern or Central Europe, Russia or Poland or the like. But the scene shifts beginning this evening, and most of the rest of the time that we will spend together will be spent in the United States, or if not in the United States, uh, in other countries as they have been related to the United States. Uh, I didn't quite realize it when I set up the course that I would be beginning in Germany, pausing in Poland, and finally arriving in our own country. That may be the history of your own family. It's certainly the history of American uh, Jewry as a whole, and maybe that's why I followed it. But we are back home again tonight, uh, or we will be in the process of coming home tonight, because for the, the major part of what will occupy us over our next sessions, which will, will be movements who have their existence and their roots here in the United States, uh, and our movements, therefore, which are trying to define for us what it means to be a Jew in modern times. Now, the shift of the scene from Central and Eastern Europe to the United States means a shift, too, in the major emphasis uh, of the definitions that we have been considering. Just as it was true that in Eastern and Central Europe, the major efforts to define what it meant to be a Jew were given in terms of nationality. So as soon as one talks about Jewry in the United States, you must immediately say that while Zionism has had a great impact, Zionism of the kind that we have been talking about, particularly the last few sessions in Europe, never has had a similar impact in the United States. That is to say, the ideology of Zionism, the rejection of the freedom given the Jew, the insistence upon the fact that the Jew could never trust the outside world which had given him rights, the declaration that as soon as things got difficult in society, it would be the Jew that would be attacked, and as a result, the Jew never could have his own rights until he had his own state. And the definition of the Jew in non- or even anti-religious terms, to the extent that those motifs have been characteristic of Zionism, and they have been characteristic of certain kinds, particularly of Central and Eastern European Zionism, to the extent that these motifs have been characteristic of Zionism, they have never been dominant in the United States. They have never been dominant either as the major means of Jewish identification here. Most Jews have not said, I am a Jew in America because I am part of a, of a Zionist movement. Uh, I understand my Jewishness in America to mean affiliation with and part of a Zionist movement which preaches this doctrine about my position here. Uh, in the United States. As a matter of fact, <laughs> wake up! We were now taking bets on how long the lights will stay on. As a matter of fact, not only has the definition of uh, Zionism never been dominant within the American Jewish community as a whole, it has never been dominant among American Zionists. There have always been a small number of American Zionists who have taken up these motifs and made them an integral part of their Zionism. But by and large, American Zionism has been distinguished by its 
humanitarian interests, by its interests in rescue, uh, by the sense of uh, Jews helping one another, by philanthropy, by even a certain desire to increase Jewishness, but not by Zionist ideology, not by Zionism as a definition of the relationship of the Jew to the non-Jew in an emancipated uh, social situation. So that if we shift, therefore, from Central and Eastern Europe, we must shift our major theme. And just as it was not possible, well, that's a strong word to use, just as it was not possible for religious answers to arise in Central and Eastern Europe, so the very circumstance of the American way of life, the situation, political and social, in which Jews found themselves in this country, did not make it possible for the ideological Zionist position to take firm root here, but to the contrary, the religious answer did. For the rest of the course, therefore, we shall be considering these two major answers of what it means to be a Jew in the modern world, either the Zionist one, which says that one is a Jew by virtue of living in the state of Israel, or by some relationship to the ideology which gave birth to the state of Israel, or the religious answer, the answer which says that a Jew is a Jew primarily by virtue of his relationship uh, with God, as the Jewish tradition has understood this in the past. Thus, the minute we come back to the United States, we return to the religious motif, the motif with which we first dealt when we discussed the entire change that came into Jewish life, the reform movements which had come into Judaism, Reform Judaism, Conservative Judaism, and as I have insisted before, that reform movement uh, known as Orthodox Judaism. Now, the setting of American Jewish life, the environment which the individual Jew found when he arrived in this country, already changed the kind of answer and the kind of definition which he could give to what it meant to be a Jew in the modern world. Much of what we will have to discuss this evening will be discussing the situation, the unique situation, in which the Jew found himself in this country. Now, the Jews arrived here, as we know, a little over 300 years ago. We celebrated the uh, tercentenary of the Jewish arrival in the United States. It was a great thrill to record that Jews had been here as an organized community for a little over 300 years. I should, however, like to take a, what is a somewhat radical position. I'm not particularly proud of it because it's radical. Uh, by and large, I don't think there's anything very important going on in American Jewish history uh, before the middle of the 19th century. In other words, about 120, 130 years ago. The first 170 years are there. And as you shall see, I think they play a, something of an important place in American Jewish history. But I can't get terribly excited about them. In other words, there were Jews here at the beginning of New York, and one of the first things that we see in their record is their fight for Jewish rights. And Asser Levy, who was one of that group of 23 colonists who arrived, established something which the rest of American Jewry has lived up to ever since, namely that Jews want rights for which they are willing to sacrifice in the United States. Now, there are great heroes uh, of the beginnings of many of the uh, colonies and the colonial governments. There are uh, Jews who took their part in the Revolutionary War. There is Chaim Solomon, uh, about whom we all know, whom, as some wag has put it, if he hadn't been there, he would have have to have been invented, and maybe he was. Uh, it's a little difficult for a Jew to assess really how important Chaim Solomon was. Uh, sometimes with religious school children, one gets the impression that they think that George Washington couldn't have existed a moment without him. On the other hand, there are numbers of people that can be pointed to. There's Uriah Phillips Levy, the famous Commodore of the uh, United States Navy, uh, a rather high rank uh, for a Jew and a professing Jew to reach at that time, of whom we have a letter to the chief of one of the South American uh, countries who had uh, written him that he would like him to come to be the admiral of his fleet in complete charge of his navy. And he wrote a letter in the flamboyant style of that era saying, I would rather be a cabin boy 
in the service of the United States of America than chief of any other navy in the world. But he was also a man who had an instrumental part to play in the abolition of flogging in the United States Navy, uh, something which is in the highest accord of the Jewish tradition, namely to abolish flogging, I think. Um, and there are other such heroes. I say this because I do not wish to uh, have my perhaps prejudices or subjective attitudes toward early American Jewish history influence you into thinking that nothing happened. There were numbers of very interesting and extraordinary people and they set up their life and they <coughs> formed the basis of everything that went before. But the critical part of American Jewish history, I think, begins when Jews arrive in significantly large numbers and the history of a people rather than a significant individual seems to commence. With what has been called the German wave of immigration to the United States, I think that kind of history begins. It begins in the late 30s and picks up in the 40s and carries on through the 50s, 60s, and even into the 70s. Uh, it was a, an immigration, not of hundreds anymore, but of thousands, and occasionally even of tens of thousands. Now, this was a period of rapid immigration to the United States in any case. But a considerable number of German Jews, or perhaps of Germanic Jews, since there was no real Germany yet, but Jews of this, well, almost central part of Europe, God forbid I should have said to a German Jew of that day that he was from Central Europe, but Jews of this in part of Europe lying, again, I'm going to use a horrible word, east of France, uh, in these miscellaneous little communities, part of which were part of Austro-Hungary and part of which were small uh, German states. These people came in considerable numbers to the United States. And they moved and spread with the growth and the development of the American economy. Those cities in the United States, which still retain a largely Germanic flavor, still very strongly show the control and the dominance of these old German Jewish families. When one visits Cincinnati or Louisville or St. Louis or Milwaukee, cities of this kind where the 19th century German uh, immigration seized hold were also cities where German Jewish population uh, took great hold as well. I shouldn't have left out Baltimore. It was a major seaport then, as it is today, and it was a, another great German Jewish city, perhaps the mother of the other uh, German Jewish cities. Now, it's interesting to see what these German Jews did, whether it was because they were German, or whether it's because they were there in large enough numbers, or both, as seems likely. They set to work to organizing Jewish communities. Now, notice what I just said. They organized Jewish communities. That in itself is already an astonishing fact. They didn't come into the community and go to the chief of police and register with the chief of police as to which community of faith they were enlisted in. They didn't have to make themselves part of a governmental apparatus which controlled the religious organizations from which taxes, for which taxes were collected from everybody who said he was part of that community. There was no organization to the community unless the Jews voluntarily organized it. From that day to this one, the chief and distinguishing characteristic of the American Jewish community has been that with some modest exceptions, with some small outside help, the Jewish community in the United States is the first one that we know of practically, practically through all of human, of human that is to say, human history and Jewish history in human history, that has been a volunteer community. Whatever exists in the Jewish community in the United States exists voluntarily. Now, I admit that the volunteers have sometimes been given a push by the outside world, 
which have refused to allow them to escape, at least en masse. But that didn't say that the Jews had to get together and organize things. Congregations and cemeteries and orphan asylums and hospitals. They didn't have to do that, but they did. And from that day to this, the most difficult thing to understand is that American Jewish life is by and large voluntary. And the less discrimination there is, the more and more voluntary it becomes. No other Jews have ever had this kind of experience of building a community without governmental help, without even a governmental structure supporting it. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> Just relax. We want to make sure it's been a hard week and uh, it's a lovely night outside. And since you came, we just relax and quiet down. <laughs> Someone may have confused this with the session on hypnosis, and the effort is to see whether or not I can put you all to sleep. If I scream about once every seven minutes, it's because I'm sure no one will ever discover that the lights are out in here, and who cares anyway? Don't tell them. I, you know, if they keep spending this kind of money on fuses, even our generous contributions to the Federation won't be enough. Now, this voluntary aspect to American Jewish life has been both its curse as well as its sign of greatness. It's a curse because anybody who wants to get a few Jews together to start something can do it. And they do it all the time. You know, one organization after another organization, another organization, another organization. They all have card parties, and they all have theater parties, and they all have fashion shows, and they're all busy, 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 busy. They're all busy for worthwhile purposes. It's a good cause. And what isn't a good cause? And you know, you really, in a way, can't object to them. Because every time you organize another organization, there are 10 or 20 people there who assume a responsibility in Jewish life that they wouldn't do otherwise. That is to say, if they assume the responsibility, which they very often do, a person becomes a president and he feels he has to do something. And he does something Jewishly as a volunteer. The reason that we need these organizations is if there were, the organizations weren't there, there wouldn't be any Jewish life. On the other hand, it is the curse of Jewish life because it means that there is absolutely no discipline. The great threat in American Jewish life, well, if that's what you're going to do, I'll resign. They can resign from anything. Or if they don't resign, they just simply don't pay any attention to you. They are indifferent. They are inert. This is the great curse of American Jewish life that one cannot exert any kind of discipline on members of the Jewish community. On the other hand, maybe it's not a curse. Maybe it just means we need to bring Jews to learn to live a certain way because they ought to live that way, because they want to live that way, and we shall try to somehow be mature enough to educate them to it and somehow find patience to live with them even when they disagree uh, with us in one way or another. One of the great contributions and the lasting contributions of the German Jews to the United States is that when they got to this country in the middle of the 19th century, they began to organize together to do Jewish things. They established a basic network of organizations, which to this day forms the basis of the American Jewish way of life. I referred a moment ago to the Federation of Jewish Philanthropies of New York. The Federation of Jewish Philanthropies of New York is in its origins, although not quite in its current status, a German Jewish organization. It is still largely dominated by German sounding names. And somehow people in the New York area still have the feeling that somehow Federation is still somehow more Germany and more socially acceptable and more prominent and more well, I don't want to use any more disturbing words because, after all, it is a very fine organization, whereas the UJA is somehow more Jewish and more East European and more uh, acceptable. By and large, these attitudes still exist, and they exist in many another community as well, although there, by this time, the Federation and UJA drives have, almost without exception, become merged in one. But that's part of the later history of the American Jewish community, and I don't want to get you into it. The German Jews, when they came to this country, founded organizations which, if they weren't combined campaigns like the Federation is, they founded organizations 
not just synagogues and not just cemeteries, which the Jews had had, but organizations for doing Jewish charitable work. They founded literary societies and they founded educational societies, but they founded also other institutions of Jewish community life. Jewish hospitals across the country are almost without exception traceable to the German Jews. And that institution, which in our own lifetime we have seen practically abolished, namely the orphan asylum. The orphan asylum, which today we do not prefer to have, rather uh, preferring to place children in individual homes, foster homes, uh, where they're in a real family situation and where a loving foster parents will care for them. The Jewish orphan home to take care of children who didn't have any place to go is a, an institution formed by the German Jews. Institution for indigent Jews, help uh, to the poor, the organizations to help immigration to the United States and to help immigrants once they had arrived in the United States. These were all due to the German Jews. They provided the backbone upon which the rest of us have continued to build. No, not quite. We used to think that there were no Russian Jews or Polish Jews or Ashkenazic Jews before the Russian Jews. And we discovered, therefore, that in the effort to generalize about American Jewish history, we overemphasize. You know, we say there was a Sephardic wave of immigration, then a German wave of immigration, then an East European wave. Well, it's interesting. Chaim Solomon was an East European Jew. Now, that'll be my example. When you start examining the background of the Jews who were in the United States before the Germans arrived in great numbers, there were a lot of them from Eastern and Central Europe. It wasn't entirely Sephardic. Uh, a Central and East European Jew could get in. And even during the, the German period, there was continuing migration from the uh, East European countries. The only thing is it didn't become a roar and overcome the rest of the community until later this century, as we shall see next week. Now, these German Jews established the organizations, and they formed a base which led to an extraordinary event in the United States. Extraordinary both for the history of Jews elsewhere, and extraordinary because I don't think you would expect it. Namely, that in the American Jewish community in the middle of the 19th century, the dominant, the dominating, the leading group of Jews in most communities were Reform Jews. From the middle of the 19th century, not immediately with the rise of the German Jews, because it, it took a while, but as the Civil War passed, from that time on, up until the First World War, it was quite clear that Reform Judaism uh, in the United States was the dominant group. It had the social leadership, it had the community leadership, it was the element which was controlling what was going on in Jewish life. Now that's extraordinary. It's extraordinary because normally you would think that, you know, they really have to have a strong Orthodox community or a traditionally observant Jewish community before you get a breakaway and then some kind of a small reform group. Certainly that's what happened in Europe. And secondly, we know that Reform Judaism hadn't really spread that much in Europe. It hadn't really developed to the point where it had become a major and a dominant movement even in Germany. We are therefore faced with a very interesting historical event, and we must probe it. And that was why Reform Judaism became dominant in the United States. And what this has to tell us about what Jews in America have been taught about what it means to be a Jew in modern times. Now why? Why did Reform Judaism become dominant in the United States in the 19th century? Now one answer is, I think, obvious, namely that the Jews who were coming into the country at that time were Jews who had arrived from Germany. And they were Jews who carried with them knowledge. Maybe they hadn't followed it themselves, but they knew of such a thing as a reform movement. It was a living option for them. It was possible for them to think of Judaism as a kind of a, of a changing religion, because they'd seen it change. They had heard about the changes that were going on in Germany. And remember, these were people who had already had some opportunity to live under freedom. More or less, with the governments now being liberal and now being reactionary, they had had a taste of freedom. They had had a taste of the general Jewish world, and they had the experience of seeing some Jews living in a liberal way. 
They were thus prepared, in a way, for what they found in the United States. And perhaps this may explain the fact that when they got here, and the communities were largely Germanic, the German-Jewish reform congregations, or congregations that soon became reform, that took over the dominance. A second explanation may be given, not on so simple a level, but uh, on a more profound level, and yet also perhaps in a somewhat superficial way. One may say it is due to the emergence of a great man. Sometimes a great man takes and shapes history, moves it in a certain direction, and that he is therefore responsible for what happened to American Jewry. Certainly the history of the Jews of the United States would be radically different if it were not for the personality of a man like Isaac Mayer Wise. Whether one is orthodox, conservative, reform, or cultural by one's own definition uh, of Jewishness in our time. The history and the activity of Isaac M. Wise have most profoundly shaped the situation of the Jew in the United States. One doesn't have to be a reformed Jew to recognize him as a giant. What did he do? Well, in the first place, he left this marvelous book describing his experiences in the early days in the United States. If he had done nothing else but write his reminiscences, which uh, one can still read with great joy and profit, it would have been enough. He gives us our most intimate picture of what it was like to be a leader in the 1840s and in the early 1850s in the United States. When Isaac Mayer Rise arrived in the United States, he had the impression that he was the only so-called rabbi, there were a number of ministers and readers and chazanim, uh, but he was the only rabbi that he knew of in the country who had a firm background in rabbinic texts. He felt he was one of the few men in the country who had enough Jewish scholarship to read an unpointed, an unvocalized Hebrew text. Now, you don't have to know very much about Hebrew to know that any of the major texts after the Bible and the prayer book are printed generally without vowel points. It says something about the level of Jewish scholarship. And his impressions of the Jewish congregations as he saw them in the Jewish life were, I mean, as one reads them, one is almost as downhearted as he was when he had the experience. And the good friends to whom he had letters of introduction when he arrived in the United States, to a man said to him, an intelligent, university-trained person such as yourself should go out and find an honorable way to make a living. Anything but being a rabbi. The cause of Judaism in the United States will be lost very shortly. Don't associate yourself with something which has no prospect of the future. But this was not Isaac Mayer Wise's way. Not only was he a Jew and a rabbi, but he was determined to see to it that American Jewry had leadership. Fantastic thing that a young man walks in, in his early 30s, from the middle of Bohemia, and has a vision of what American Jewry should be like. A man who was imbued with a spirit of freedom, with the knowledge of what it meant to be a, a free individual living under a government that tolerated differences. And he went to work to build it. That is to say, he went to work when a congregation heard him and was willing to accept him, and then discovered that he had some radical ideas about what a congregation should be. He believed, as did the reformers of Germany, and he had participated in one of the, or said he had participated uh, in one of the rabbinical conferences of Germany, which you heard about some weeks ago, so that he wanted, for example, to have a choir with mixed voices, men and women singing together. He wanted, for example, to cut out some of the unnecessary piyutim, the long poems, which he felt did not help the service. He preached uh, in English uh, to the members of the congregation. I think he preached in English in Albany. I'm not certain. He may have preached in German uh, still there. Uh, he had rather radical ideas, therefore. But he built the congregation in Albany and very quickly became known through his traveling around the country and mostly through his writing as a, as a leading personality. And he was dominated by a vision, a vision which haunted him all his life. It was a vision of what was to be accomplished by the possibility of building an American Judaism in which everyone was united. So as a result, what he tried to do was to find some basis of bringing all Jews together, but in a liberal way. He wanted Judaism to grow and develop and expand. He was a reformed Jew. 
And yet, unity was the dearest thing to him. He believed that everyone would become a liberal sooner or later. It seemed the only logical, rational thing to happen. And particularly when he saw America, he believed it would happen. So he tried to get established a school for training American boys to be rabbis. In those days, they had to be imported from Europe. So he tried to establish some basis of rabbis meeting together to discuss the problems of what it meant to be a Jew in the United States. But he failed in that as well. And he went from congregation to congregation and spoke of his idea of unity and organization and of liberalism because he was a liberal. He traveled up and down the United States. He went everywhere. It's incredible to believe that in a day when the railroads uh, didn't operate to every city and you very often had to go by boat and when there was snow, the boats, or when there was ice rather on the rivers, the boats didn't go and one had to travel by buggy and cart uh, and, and the like, that this man went just about everywhere that anyone could possibly go. It's hard to find a community of the South or the Middle West that had any substantial number of Jews in those days that Isaac Mayer Wise didn't visit. Iowa, South Carolina, uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, Wisconsin, Michigan, he was everywhere. Sooner or later in his long life, which lasted well into the uh, 80s, as I recall, I think he was 90 uh, uh, when he died, uh, Isaac Mayer Wise dominated the Judaism of this country, and he organized it. This was his great and his lasting contribution. He finally was able not to get a rabbinical school started and not to get the rabbis to talk to one another. He was finally able to get together a nucleus of congregations, 23, who joined together to establish a union of American Hebrew, since they avoided the words Jewish in those days, a union of American Hebrew congregations. Notice, a union of American, not reform, and not conservative and not orthodox, a union of American Hebrew congregations in the hope that all congregations would be able to join together. And what were its major purposes? Its major purposes were, one, to establish an American Jewish rabbinical school, and two, to provide for the education of American Jewish children in American Jewish synagogues, and three, to let the synagogues help one another do their work better. That's all. He hoped for unity. That's why he called it a union. Two years later, this Union of American Hebrew Congregations established a rabbinical school, which was called the Hebrew Union College. It was a union college, a college of all groups working together. And it really seemed that it might be possible for it to be so until, after a series of events, uh, uh, finally, it was not possible to do so, and the Hebrew Union College, as the Union of American Hebrew Congregations, gradually became more and more denominational. And his final contribution was that late in the century, in the 1890s, I believe, he was finally able to formulate a central conference of American rabbis. Not reform, and not orthodox, and not conservative rabbis, but a central conference in which all rabbis could participate. But he was doomed to failure and disappointment on all three counts. His Union of American Hebrew Congregations very quickly became a union of reform Jewish congregations, the uh, Orthodox congregations and the almost Orthodox congregations, since there was no conservative movement at this time, refused to come in. The Hebrew Union College very, uh, very soon after its existence almost 10 years after its existence, was challenged with the existence of a modern orthodox, that is to say a non-orthodox but also non-reform rabbinical school called the Jewish Theological Seminary of America, about which we shall hear more next week. And then, uh, finally, uh, the other organizations began and continued. It's going to happen all night. Just get adjusted. There must be either... No, can't do it. Keep putting them in and putting them out. And don't use a penny. <laughs> now that we have had these flashes of light thrown on the subject, perhaps it was Isaac Mayer Wise who was responsible. Perhaps it was the fact that one man came along who was a genius, who could organize people, who could get them to work together, who could give them rabbis, who could give them direction, who published a newspaper 
who published in English and published in German and carried on <laughs> and carried on in such a way as to make sure that uh, Judaism would have direction and leadership. Perhaps that's the, uh, the key to the Jewish success. And I think in large part it is. It took a great man to organize Reform Judaism in the United States. As a matter of fact, it took a great man to reorganize conservative Judaism in the United States, Solomon Schechter, about whom we shall hear more next week. But I don't think that's the final answer. I think that the final answer lies in something else, and it represents the difference between the American Jew and the Zionist ideologists, both of Europe and today of the State of Israel. It represents an answer which the American Jew, whether he is Orthodox, Conservative, or Reform, has given to the Israeli or to the Zionist ideologue of the older school. And what is that? It is a statement which says simply, America is different. There was something different about being a Jew in the United States which tends to refute the Zionist analysis of what it means to be a Jew in modern society, and which made possible in a positive way the rise of Reform Judaism to dominance. But what is it that makes us think that America is different from all the other countries in modern times where Jews have lived? Now, let's take it quite simply. In the first place, from the very founding of the country, there were Jews here. It is not quite possible to say almost anywhere in the United States that now that we build up a country, now the Jews arrive and want to take it over. From the very beginning, singly and in families, particularly in the larger cities and in the more influential places, there have always been Jews. We American Jews say with some pride, even though I seem to have scoffed at it a little earlier, that we have had Jews dying in every war. We were there at the Revolution, and we were there before the Revolution. We were there with Asser Levy standing on the stockades, defending against the Indians. He would not buy his way out of the New York State Militia. He demanded a right to risk his life for the defense of the colony. And we've stood by that ever since. There have always been Jews here. This is our country as much as it's anybody else's. We helped make it as everybody else helped make it. So that not only did we feel we had a different stake in it, in large part the country didn't grow up and get established without the Jews. But this, of course, is the second point. The second point is that this country wasn't established on the basis of any old hatreds. You don't find in the United States records of five, six, or seven hundred years of the persecution of Jews because nobody's been here that long. In the year 1260, there were no Jews in the United States to persecute. But there were also no Christians here to persecute them. There were only Indians, we think. And therefore, one cannot trace back this century after century history of persecution and rivalry and hatred. The people who had come here could not say that to be an American has meant to have had an experience of persecuting and and killing and hating Jews. And the Jew, as he walked down the street of his community, walked around and could not point to a street as the Juden Gasse. This is not the street where the Jews had to live, and there are the remains of the old ghetto wall, and there is the cemetery in which the martyrs of such and such a pogrom are buried. And the city looks peaceful now, but you should remember 400 years ago in one Easter day as the result of a sermon preached in such and such. Those memories weren't there. They weren't there so that the Jew felt himself isolated and cut off. And from the Reformed Jewish point of view, may I add, there was also no long, old, established, traditional Jewry. One couldn't say in any Jewish community that, look, my grandfather did it this way, my great-grandfather sat in this synagogue, and my great-grandfather is buried out there in the cemetery. How will he feel if I come into this synagogue without a hat? Because great-grandfather was buried on the other side of the ocean. And you weren't in his shul anymore. You were in a new shul, which you had to build, maybe. You had to make it. You had to find. There was no community tradition which said to be a Jew is to be orthodox or to be traditional. 
So in a negative sense, there was no long history of anti-Semitism. A Jew had opportunities. He had rights. He wasn't forced to be cut off and isolated. He did have what the emancipation had promised him. And in a positive way, he also didn't have this old tradition of orthodoxy, which said this is the only normal thing to be. If you deviate from this, there's something the matter with you. Or to put it in its more positive form now, from both these arguments, what was happening in the entire society of the United States? It was a frontier society, to use Turner's phrase. Now think what that means in Jewish terms, in terms of building a community. Everybody was changing everything. Who knew what the American society was supposed to be? There were no kings, no nobles, no castles. Everything was open, everything was moving. You went in, you made a living, you made a few dollars, you got established, you built a new society. The next thing, you were one of the big men in town. And if you couldn't do it here, you go to another city. Where are the traditions of the community? Sure, they built up. And in some of the cities in the United States, they were rather strong. Certain areas of the South, and certain areas of New England, where they solidified rather quickly. But in most places in the United States, there was a dynamism and a movement which gave opportunity. And for the Jewish point of view here was opportunity. Well, he moved and he mixed and he mingled. There was educational opportunity, there was economic opportunity. How many German Jews whose scions today either own or control or sit at the head of great department stores who are great men in retailing, four generations back began with a Jew with a pack on his back who trudged down country lanes from farmhouse to farmhouse selling what he had carried with him and after many weeks finally arrived back home. How many of them started that way and then finally got enough capital together to open a single little room store and gradually build it up into these great commercial enterprises which we know in our day? That's America. But that's a new way of life. The way of life wasn't set. And the same thing had its impact on Judaism. Everything's changing. Everybody's branching out. The whole country is moving forward. And finally, there is the notion of democracy. Over or against the Zionist notion that Jews never can have real rights is the assertion that this country was started on the basis of equal rights. It had to be started on the basis of equal rights because there were so many unequal people to begin here in the old European terms that unless they had agreed that everybody was equal, they could never have gotten started. The Catholics in the South and the old descendants of the Puritans in the North and various other Protestant groups scattered around, they had to agree to live with one another, otherwise they couldn't have lived with one another. The basic notion of the country was everyone has rights as an individual. All men are equal before the law. And if there has been a fight about what equal before the law means, it hasn't been the Jews that have been involved in it. Oh, there have been fights, and we continue to carry them on from time to time. It's been the Negro who's had to bear the brunt of the question as to whether or not the equality of man in the United States is applied to man as man, or by man as member of a racial group. The Jew hasn't had to bear it. We've had our disabilities, but we've fought them through from Asser Levy on, and we've never really had the serious kind of problem with them. But there's something else about democracy. There is not only the notion of democracy which worked to make the Jew feel at home in this country, but there is the notion of democracy which says, we the people create the government. We the people. It's a marvelous idea, but supposing you apply it to religion. If we the people need another kind of religion to mix and mingle in this kind of a democratic society. We, the people, create the kind of Judaism that's desirable and suitable for this way of life. This is not a, a cut-off kind of Jewish existence. This is not an isolated and partial point of view. This is an existence which partakes of the entire structure of American society. Thus, it was, at least by hindsight, as logical as it could be, that these Jews who came to the United States and found freedom and opportunity and equality, who found themselves part of a growing and developing and expanding and democratic America, should apply these same characteristics to their religion or, 
should seek a form of religious identity which would make it possible for them fully to participate in American life. And that was reform. It was a Judaism which was willing to make adaptation of the outward signs of Judaism one of its chief characteristics. That was the slogan of the reform Jews. We will reform. We change the forms in order to make it possible to live and mix as a member of this society because what's essentially important to our religion is not the forms, but the inner message that it bears. Now, this is why I think Reform Judaism was dominant in the late 19th century and the early 20th century as well. Now, to say that is not only to explain a great deal about the American Jewish situation, but is to lay the groundwork for explaining also how it happened that the Reform Jews not only lost this position, although in some measure they never have, socially somehow we still consider the Reform Jews a little fancier. They are somehow the Episcopalians uh, of our community. Uh, Anyone who wants to mix and mingle with a somehow nicer group gets involved supposedly with the Reform congregation. Uh, I don't vouch for this, by the way. I simply report it as a sociological fact that the reform Jewish label is normally considered to be a a somewhat more socially uh, uh, acceptable or desirable label. Now, in order to understand what happens, we have to see how the reform Jewish movement developed. And we have to understand what it said about what it meant to be a Jew in the United States. Now, you notice I've said that Jews who wanted to mix and mingle in this kind of society took reform Judaism. They really didn't have any alternative on the subject of religion at all. The alternative of saying they were a separate nationality and they wanted autonomous nationality rights, a la Dubno, would have been unthinkable in the United States. To set up a separate community with separate nationalistic rights. To say that they wanted to leave the United States and go to another country would have also been unthinkable in view of the opportunity and of the rights which were given to them. If they didn't want to come to this country, what did they come here for in the first place? If they came and they didn't like it, let them go. So what kind of status could they find? But there was one thing which was quite clear in the United States. Freedom of religion. It was written into the Constitution. We don't want you to be different as a citizen. We don't want you to be different by nationality. But if you wish to be different by religion, difference by religion is permitted. It's not only permitted, it's actually encouraged. The government says, you may trust us to keep our hands off religion. Therefore, it says, if you want a religion, please go ahead and develop it. So long as it doesn't really danger the health, safety, welfare, or morals of the community, the government will stay far away from it. As a matter of fact, as we have seen in our own times, there are even certain kinds of encouragement which the government, by its special tax considerations, gives to religion. And if you don't think that's an encouragement, compare it to the Soviet picture, where the government has the right to tax at rates that it sets, naturally, the religious institutions. The reform movement, then, which took very strong root in this country, was part of a religious answer. But it was a religious answer which developed in a very singular way. Isaac Mayer Wise was so much for unity in the United States that he would have accepted almost any kind of compromise to bring Jews under one roof. At a famous Cleveland conference of rabbis, he was even willing to vote for and sign his name to a declaration which said that Jews should accept the Talmud as binding as an authority in Jewish life. Now, I'm sure what Isaac Mayer Wise meant by that was that the Talmud is binding that we should use Talmudical method and Talmudical reasoning to arrive at more modern theories. But there were other Reform Jews who disagreed with Wise and said that he was a traitor, that he had sold out uh, to the traditionalists. And it was these Reform Jews who eventually won the day. Isaac Mayer Wise was in his own way a very traditional Jew. He was a man who believed that two-thirds of the study of Jewish children in schools should be a study of Hebrew. He believed very strongly in the observance of the Sabbath, which many other Reform Jews did as well. He even tried to normally keep his members and officers keep their stores closed on Shabbos, regularly, quite a bit. And this was also true of certain other Reform Jews. But the Reform movement, 
once its members had become integrated into the United States, began to move steadily more and more toward its radical wing. And in order to give you the picture of that radical wing, I have to refer to a man whom you probably have not heard of before. Under normal circumstances, it would be it would be customary if one spoke about the early days of Reform Judaism in the United States to devote the lecture entirely to Isaac M. Wise. I put Kaufman Kohler's name on what I wanted to say here because he was the ideologue, the philosopher, the thinker who formalized and in a way exemplified what Reform Judaism came to stand for uh, in the United States. Uh, it's not that he said anything particularly new or startling that we have not heard. But it was because who he was and what he represented that Kaufman Kohler and the book that he wrote uh, must still be considered, and not Isaac Mayer wise, must be considered the, the great exemplar of the early Reform Jewish point of view. What you have to know about Kaufman Kohler is really quite simple. Kaufman Kohler was a German born rabbi. He came to the United States, he had had a tremendous education, both traditional Jewish and uh, one of the German university uh, PhDs. This fantastic uh, combination which made it possible for him to be one of the major contributors to what will probably go down in history as the lasting monument of American Jewish scholarship. Namely, a 12 volume set of books called the Jewish Encyclopedia. The Jewish Encyclopedia was published in 1904. It's again one of those German Jewish enterprises an effort to present the totality of Jewish scholarship before the scholarly world. Kaufman Kohler was not only one of the editors of the Jewish Encyclopedia, I believe he wrote more single articles for it than any other man. What was Kaufman Kohler's field of uh, endeavor? It's interesting. He was the first, and some say the last, of his kind. He was a Jewish theologian. He was a man who sought to take the ideas of the Jewish religion and expound them philosophically and rationally so that people could understand them in their interrelationships. He wrote the first book of systematic Jewish theology ever written. It is, as far as I can tell, really the only one of its kind that ever was written. It was called, quite simply, Jewish Theology, and its subtitle is historically and systematically considered. What did Kaufman Kohler do? He took every major Jewish idea, God, God as judge, God as king, God as uh, the justice of God, the love of God, the mercy of God, the providence of God, sin, repentance, atonement, prayer, the synagogue, the holidays, the festivals, ethics, the kingdom of God, the mission of Israel. He took all these ideas, and in every chapter he takes one idea and he traces it from the biblical time through the rabbinic material through the medieval writers through the late medieval writers and it finally gives a modern synthesis here was a man who claimed to know enough about the jewish religion that he could take every major idea and trace the major developments concerning it. Fantastic, no? Not only fantastic, but he actually did it. To this day, no one has claimed that Kohler ever made a really major mistake. Sometimes difficult to track down his references. We certainly very often disagree, as I shall explain, with what he says in his concluding paragraph, trying to give the modern point of view in each of these. Uh, thing. But that he has really gotten the essence of the biblical point of view, the rabbinic point of view, and given us the, the heart of what the medievals had to say. Yes, he did. He knew it. And when he wrote these hundreds of little articles, I think there's an article on hell in the Jewish Encyclopedia written by Kaufman Kohler, the names of God. Little things like it. He wrote the Encyclopedia articles. This man was Isaac Mayer Wise's successor as the president of the Hebrew Union College. He served as the leader of the development of the Reform Rabbinate from 1900 to about 1923. In that period in which Reform Judaism was in its absolute dominance, he set the tone for what Reform Judaism was. And more than that, 
He was elected particularly to fill in those aspects where Wise had been weak. Wise had not been a radical. Wise had not been a uh, liberal in uh, the direction that I am speaking. And Kohler was. Now, mind you, no leading Jewish scholar up to this time had ever been anything other than a master of the law. One who knew the halakha, the Jewish way of life, who could judge on subjects of whether or not an animal is kosher or whether or not in a litigation over a contract justice belonged with the defendant or uh, the person who was uh, suing him. Here was a man whose field of knowledge was Jewish ideas. And this expresses what had happened to Reform Judaism. Reform Judaism had become now not so much a way of life as a way of believing, a kind of a creedal and doctrinal affirmation. It had become very much like certain kinds of Protestant movements in the United States, it had a system of believing. The God idea had become the heart of Reform Judaism in the Pittsburgh Platform, which was the the basis of much of the Reformed uh, thinking, which I believe Kaufman Kohler was the spiritual father of, emphasizes what is the unique and central contribution of Judaism to the world is its God idea, the notion of God as a single, all-embracing unity. A God idea which at the, at the same time was ethical and righteous and demanding. It was this idea which distinguished the Jewish religion from all other religions. And therefore, if what made a Jew a Jew was holding on to a certain idea, then obviously the rituals didn't count, kashras didn't count, the kind of worship that you did in the synagogue should be the kind of worship which would be acceptable in terms of the aesthetic standards of the community of which you were a part, polyphonic music, men and women, non-Jews if necessary, if you couldn't find Jews to have beautiful music, worship, without hats, because that was customary in this part of the world, dignity and decorum, since that was the general American way of paying attention to things that were serious, and a certain kind of seriousness about religion. Uh, I was talking to a reform rabbi the other night who was terribly distressed about uh, Chayefsky's The Tenth Man. The way the old men in that synagogue in Mineola talked to one another, he thought was ill-befitting a house of worship. I wanted to tell them that it wasn't a house of worship, it was a shul, <laughs> which would make all the difference in the world, you see. There's a difference between davening and worshiping. And he, he just didn't understand this. All this had become a part of Reform Judaism. Now, it wasn't so much a part of Kaufman Kohler. If you read Kaufman Kohler's book, he was a very deeply, not only believing Jew, and not only devoted to his ideas, but he was devoted to the Jewish people. It's a part of Kaufman Kohler that people like to dodge now. Kaufman Kohler, based upon the experience of his time, talked about the Jewish race. In those days, the doctrine of races was just coming to the fore, and Kaufman Kohler spoke about the Jewish race because he believed it was somehow necessary to protect the Jewish collective. If all you have is an idea about God, then you write it down or you give it to somebody else and they've got it, and there you are. They're in business too, and what do you need to be Jews for? No, he said. The Jews have a mission. The mission of Israel is to spread this idea of God throughout the world. The Jews, by virtue of the qualities built into them, have a special talent for religion and for religious ideas and developing them and carrying them out in one age after another. This is our God-given responsibility, he said, and we must live up to it. So that from Kohler's point of view, the synagogue and the people of the synagogue, the Jewish religious group, were an important group. And yet I think it must be said in all honesty that at the beginning of the 20th century, the reformed Jews were largely a kind of a, of a creedal group. They didn't follow Kaufman Kohler's uh, racialism. Uh, they did not accept the notion that the Jews were somehow united as Jews aside from their ideas. They were united because they had this belief, this creed, this the system of religious understanding. And that's what made a man a Jew. He did anything that any other American did, just like any other American. He had a way of believing that it was his own. It was a magnificent bridge for all the other Jews who were to follow. The Reformed Jews have paved the way for other Jews in almost every sphere of American life. 
and this idea helped them to do so. As we shall see a little later in the course, the Reformed Jews themselves have adapted this idea and gone on later uh, to another stage in their development. But I think we can leave Reformed Judaism here, seeing what it had become and how it had achieved a position of dominance. Remember, though, what Calvin and Crowley stood for and what Isaac Mayer Wise said was, America is different. One can be a Jew here by one's religious affirmations, and that's enough. One is as legitimately and meaningfully and significantly as a Jew as any Jew has been before, simply by being part of the Jewish religious group, by being part of a group which develops and continues to find new ways to be a Jew, as we have done. Now, that answer wasn't completely satisfactory as the decades went by, but that we shall take up next week when we turn to Solomon Shechter. Now, if you have a <laughs> Now, what could have been more appropriate? Now, for those of you who didn't get a sufficient nap, you may relax while the rest of us ask a few questions. Yes, please. When you say Israel, what do you mean? The state of Israel, or Palestine, or Zionism, or what? But they didn't assume this, this uh, power against Israel. They didn't assume that Israel was going to be stated in a much more positive way in 1937. But we haven't gotten to 1937 yet. Um, no, the reason that I... Uh, I didn't get a chance to discuss that. Perhaps it would have been wise if I did, so that I am therefore glad that you asked. Now, supposing you take the attitude that a Jew is a Jew by religion, and that a Jew may fulfill himself as a Jew through participating in and living by that religion. What does he need a state for? And what does he need another country for if the country that he lives in really gives him the chance to live out his religion? Therefore, what is needed is the kind of democratic society the American Jew has and that's really all you need. You have no obligation to Palestine. And particularly, if you want to take on the Zionist ideology, as we have been studying it here, at least those parts of the Zionist ideology which say you cannot trust the rights you have been given where you are, you therefore need to establish a country where you can be sure of your rights because you give them to yourself. Now that was anathema to these people. It was the exact opposite of what they stood for. And when they fought Zionism, they weren't fighting a refugee problem because there wasn't a refugee problem at that time. Anybody could immigrate to the United States who wanted to. They were opposing a point of view which said, you never can really be a full citizen. And you can't really be a Jew by religion. Now, they were against it. Now, Kohler and the Reform Jews were also against it because they said nationalism defeats the mission of Israel. The mission of Israel is that the Jews shall spread all around the world so that through the Jews, all mankind will know who God really is. The God idea of the Jews will become the God idea of all mankind. And that through the Jews, therefore, all men will come to know God and worship Him. Therefore, if you try to get all the Jews back together to Palestine, as it seemed the Zionists were saying at that time, you were not only going against the immediate political and economic situation of the Jew, you are also going against the religious obligation of the Jew to be spread all over the world and teach the idea of God to mankind. Yes? Uh, don't you also believe that the reform movement was greatly influenced by the uh, Darwin's theory of evolution? Well, uh, of course the, uh, the theory of evolution had a great impact on it, tremendous impact on it. But the notion of historic evolution before biological evolution had already taken a great hold. Yes, there's no question about it. The development of Reform Judaism is impossible without the notion of historic growth and development. That something can be true to itself and yet change. You know, that's a marvelous idea. Notice how modern and democratic it is, though. It's not an idea which would have been possible in feudal times. Because in feudal times, things were static. But when society was changing and economics were changing, it was quite possible to have this point of view even with regard to biology. And the Reform Jews shared it. Are you going to ask something? Yes.
No, I didn't. I didn't say that. I said quite specifically that Reform Judaism was born in a way as a response to the alternatives being Christianity or Ghetto Judaism. Reform Judaism was started as a way of staying a Jew. Now, is it, are there any statistics to show, I, this is, I mean, your knowledge, whether Reform Judaism was born as a I wouldn't even know how to go about answering that question because it's hard to know what you mean from its own numbers. You see, once the, the Germans and the Poles began to intermarry, who was it? Jacob Bilikoff that married Louis Marshall's daughter? Wasn't that the great uh, wedding that uh, began the disintegration of the old nationalist lines in uh, the United States? I mean, this tremendous German-Jewish family is marrying this Eastern European immigrant. And as a result, uh, the whole waves began to change. It's a little hard to know. Does the line of descent follow? If the mother is a German Jew, is the child a German Jew? You know, we'll get back to who is a Jew here. No, I don't think we can do that. Well, this is a stronger move. Is there, uh, does it have a greater hold on itself? Does it have It's a little difficult to say. You know, mm -hmm. people would always like to prove either that their movement is better or that somebody else's movement is worse. All I can say about the Reform Jews is this. Um, if one goes into the South, and into the Middle West, into communities where there's never been any kind of an Orthodox or a conservative community, one finds Reformed Jewish congregations that are 50 and 70 and 85 and 100 years old where they may never have had a rabbi. But there are a group of Jews there, they got together and they have a little congregation and maybe once a month somebody reads a service and occasionally somebody comes in to conduct a high holy day service and the reformed Jews and there's a reformed Jewish congregation. On the other hand, there are large numbers of such communities in the Middle West and the South where the, a considerable percentage of the members of the congregation are intermarried in a way in which both partners somehow preserve their own religion. So that I can't answer your question. The other answer to your question is this. Beginning with the 1870s, the immigration of Eastern European Jews began not by the thousands and not even by the tens of thousands, by the hundreds of thousands. The German Jews were just simply inundated by Jews who came in effect out of the ghetto, as I shall say. And because they came out of the ghetto, by and large, where they hadn't had rights, where they hadn't had freedom, where all they had known was their ghetto way of life. It was as if the ghetto had been brought to the United States and all of the positive advantages and all of the disadvantages of the ghetto came to the United States. And what American Judaism is today is as a result of this assimilation of the ghetto Jews who came here between 1880 and 1925. Since then, the situation has changed rather radically again. Now you'll have to stay with us, and perhaps the question can be asked in a different way at another time. Yes? I think that uh, the, uh, the new the organizations that you mentioned earlier are probably a new reflection of the American uh, principle of voluntary association. Well, I, I'm not sure I agree with either part of what you said. Number one, it's not true that all Americans gathered in voluntary groups, because they didn't. Um, the German Jews are reflecting both their experiences in Germany, as well as their experiences in the United States, as well as their Jewishness. They have a very interesting record. Uh, at any rate, it was the Germans uh, who were Jews who did respond in this way. They responded to America in this way, it is true, but also to their Germanic experience and also to their Jewishness. 
Now, as to their banding together for carrying on non-Jewish activities, this was part, or getting involved in non-Jewish activities, this was part of the whole Lanzmannschaft notion, which we still see to this day, namely people who come from the same part of the world find it more convenient to get together with one another. They speak the language of the homeland. They carry on a few of the activities. And for a long period of time, this is a major means of feeling at home. It's as if you transplant one part of a body to another part of the body. You need some of the surrounding tissue to keep you going until you're there. I don't know if I am biologically accurate, but let me go to my garden. In a garden, you transplant a, a plant. You should take a ball with it. So what do you need that dirt for? You may have better dirt over there. But if you don't carry a little of the old dirt along, something happens to the roots. And this is what the Lanzmann shop did. Uh, Isaac Mayer Wise had to get together and start groups to read poetry and get involved. This was part of the American way of life, but it was also part of the, of the necessity for biological continuity. Yes, it does vary uh, uh, high with English trying to get another Yes, but no. Yes, but no. In the practice, they didn't do it on a national basis. They did it simply on the basis of community. And what's surprising is that many of them participated in non-Jewish activities uh, to a similar way. In other words, I don't think it would have been possible to them to say, uh, now you people talk about being Jews by religion only, but you're really Jews by nationality. Look at the way you organize yourselves together. And they would say, yes, it's true that sometimes we stay largely in Jewish society. But they, don't stay, they didn't stay in Jewish society in most of these cities, I'm thinking of Cincinnati now, as much as we do today. They were able to participate in the general culture far more than, for example, most of us do today, whether in the suburbs uh, or in the metropolitan areas. No, I don't think that will hold. I'll have to answer this one quickly. There is validity to the fact that the smaller the town in which you live and the longer your family has been in the United States, the better your chances are of intermarriage. Now, since the Reformed Jews have been in the United States longer by and large than most other people, <laughs> and since by and large the, Re the Jews who have been in the smaller towns have gotten assimilated to the communities and therefore preferred to be Reformed Jews rather than to be Orthodox or later conservative Jews. It is the Reformed Jews who have been out on the frontier who qualify to these criteria. But when you go into a community where instead of being Reformed Jews, they may live as Reformed Jews, but they call themselves conservative or Orthodox Jews, the rate of intermarriage depends by and large on the factors of mixing and mingling with the American culture. The size of the city generally has more to do with the intermarriage, except when it gets to be terribly large, where you can begin to disappear, or there are avant-garde groups, or there is encouragement because it's the smart thing to do, you know, to give up these primitive and barbarian ties. Uh, the size of the city at the lower end of the level has more to do with intermarriage, in my opinion, than almost any other single factor. And since the Reformed Jews have been associated with the smaller towns, this is it. On the other hand, there is also the propaganda argument that those Reformed Jews are not really Jews anyway. Look at them, they marry all the non-Jews. But it's not true. I don't believe there's any substantiation for it. I shall see you again next week. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.